Hi, I'm Jay Abraham, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go! Hey, winners, welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Stephen Covey and says, I am not a product of my circumstances, I am a product of my decisions. Our guest today is business legend Jay Abraham. As founder and CEO of the Abraham Group, Jay has spent his career solving complex problems, fixing underperforming businesses, and identifying massive opportunities. Some of the companies he's worked with include AT&T, Baskin Robbins, Microsoft, FedEx, and Merrill Lynch, as well as renowned individuals like Brian Tracy, Damon John, and Tony Robbins, and small businesses all over the world. Jay has significantly increased the bottom lines of over of over 10,000 clients in more than 1,000 industries. He has dealt with virtually every type of business scenario and solved almost every type of business question or challenge. Jay has been featured all over mainstream media, including USA Today, The New York Times, and Entrepreneur Magazine. But today, he's with us on the Win the Day podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk with Jay about the most memorable moments from his acclaimed career, how he became the most renowned business business consultant in the world, why most entrepreneurs fail to break through to the next level, and what you can do to unlock the potential and profitability in your business. Before we begin, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Jay Abraham. <laughs> Jay, great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Thank you. And I loved uh, tremendously your little prelude. I wish my wife heard that because she wouldn't yell at me for not taking the garbage out. <laughs> we'll send her the footage as soon as the episode is live. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well, I really, I know you're a super busy guy, so it, it's a little bit surreal actually having you here in the studio. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, to kick things off, who was the very first person to believe in you? <clears throat> The very first person that believed in me was, uh, he was the man that I worked with for the product Icy Hot. He gave me a desk and a phone and no money, but a lot of instruction and a lot of encouragement. And he spent evenings after he was done with his job working with me to make sure that I didn't go awry. And he, uh, he, he, sh he showed me that you could create a vision that didn't exist. And if you believed in it enough and you kept course correcting and you were vigilant and you were passionately committed to evolving your, your ability, you could make anything happen. He took an idea and he made, he ended up selling his businesses for hundreds of millions of dollars I'm talking about in the, the the 70s when that was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And he started from scratch. He was a he was a um he worked for a pest control company. He was just an operator. And he realized that pest control operators got taken advantage of by the big companies. So he started a company just to service basically uh pest control operators who were beleaguered and being unrecognized uh, uh and he he did all kinds of wonderful things nobody did. He gained almost all the market. He took the next market, which automobile uh, detail shops. And then he just, he just owned niches where he felt that audience was underserved and wasn't getting the best service or respect or support. It was a very interesting man, but he taught me a lot. So you developed a love for helping businesses because you developed a passion for the people that were running the businesses. Is that right? I realized early in my life, James, that an entrepreneur is a remarkable man or woman. He is somebody that, uh, in its pure sense, they have a passion for creating value for a segment of a market, and they work their heart and soul out. They commit their time, their effort, their passion, their resources, their hopes, their dreams, their income expectation, their satisfaction, gratification, psychic reward expectation. It's their hope for the future. And I, get, I gained great empathy and a very great sadness because so many of them work so much harder than they have to for so much less 
and they just didn't understand how to make their investment pay off more, first and foremost for their audience, because that's where you get the reward. But yeah, I was always taken with how passionate entrepreneurs were over what I would call basically corporate types. Yeah, there's a piece that people in a corporate career don't really understand if they haven't gone down the entrepreneurial route of being able to have all of your weekends off, not being bothered so much after hours. Well, I mean, I think big corporations, uh, they, they stimulate not mediocrity, but almost an ambivalent attitude and a disconnect to the end. You're so far removed from you know, from the end game, which is serving the, the consumer, that it just, it becomes very, very abstract. But I think an entrepreneur is, you know, he or she's playing right on the front lines of capitalism. You know, their decisions, their efforts produce either success or failure, mm-hmm. income or or not. And it's just a very different game. Uh, you know, they aren't, they aren't as prosperous. They're not billion dollar uh, entities, but they're so much more fascinating. They're so much more dimensional. They're so much more authentic and they have so much more joy, I think, because if you see a lot of people in corporate America, they're not that happy. They're ambivalent, apathetic. They're going through the motion because they get paid a lot. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't get paid as much, but they have more joy and more happiness. Interesting, because uh, you're all about win the day. Many years ago, I was in Mumbai. In it, which uh, is is a huge, huge city in India. And on a weekend, we all went up into the mountains to see the biggest temple. And at the temple in the back were all these people from, I can't remember what third world country, working. They were the workers. And in the back next to the river were these two little naked little boys, about four, carrying their little naked brothers and sisters who were maybe nine months playing games and smiling and they had nothing, they had nothing and they were happy. And it really, it, I'm introducing this because I know what you're all about, but I think people don't realize that happiness isn't really correlated to making money. It really isn't uh, correlated to how prestigious it isn't correlated to whether you have a, Ferrari or you have a big mansion or you've got the hottest looking, you know, woman, wife, it's correlated to, to the fulfillment you get out of what you do, who you do it for the feedback loop you get. And I always was able to understand and appreciate that and how that drove entrepreneurs. I don't mean to go tangential on you. Yeah. I know you talk about having three midlife crises. And I, I think mm-hmm. it's really interesting that someone who focuses so much on business where profitability is obviously a significant part of that, but on the flip side, making sure that people are happy in the present. What can people do to make sure they're connected with that happiness a little bit more without having to go through things like divorce or burnout mm-hmm. in their careers? Yeah, well, I think two things, or maybe three. First of all, is realize that no two people are ever having the same reality because they don't come from the same exact background. Their values aren't the same. They didn't have the same hour day as one another unless you know, they're inextricably conjoined twins sitting in the same room all their life. So you have to give respect that what somebody else's perspective is, even if it doesn't conform to yours, that's their reality. And until you appreciate it, you can't really connect. I, I learned very early that your job in life is to Uh, examine, explore, evaluate, appreciate, understand, acknowledge, and respect how other people see life, even if you don't agree with it, because that at that freeze frame moment in time is their reality. And you have to deal with it, whether it's your spouse, your lover, your child, your coworker, your boss, your vendor. And, And when you appreciate that, that's being a human being. If we all saw it the same way, we'd be separate people. That's the first thing. The second, and you talked about, I'm not going to go through all the machinations, but I spent over half a million dollars on therapy. And most of it was a waste because, and I'm not demeaning demeaning therapists. I'm demeaning the fact that you get into very meaningful discussion and they look at their watch and it's been 50 minutes. And right at the precipice of a breakthrough, the session's over. And they go, okay, we'll pick up on this next week, James. And you're sitting the rest of the week 
uh, you know, until next week, you're neurotic. You're, you, 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 you've gotten not benefit. You've gotten more frustrated and you've gotten teased. So when I did it, I bought mine for a full week. I just bought them for a week. And if I couldn't come, I'd send every colleague, friend, coworker that was screwy <laughs> would never go. But when I'd go, I would talk through until I came to conclusions and I got one thing for a half a million dollars, which I believe is priceless and I'll share it. And it's the pro I'm giving you background, but it's the answer you want. And that is that most people are mistakenly deluded almost to think that the end product is the answer that when you make a million dollars, when you get to be the executive vice president, when you get uh, that, that beach house, when you get that Ferrari or you get that uh, gorgeous wife or you're got the fastest growing business or anything that that alone is going to forever liberate your life that the the heavens are going to open the angels are going to come out and trumpet that nirvana will bestow that you'll never have another problem that you'll just be perpetually and and permanently joyous and happy that's bullshit that the, the truth is that the process is all we've got. This conversation, interesting and hopefully impactful to others. This is as good as it gets, but it's, we were talking before to the gentleman that owns the studio. I thought that was fascinating. It was intriguing to see his perspective. It was very fascinating. I'll talk to anybody. When I used to travel extensively, particularly in countries that didn't speak English, I had a protocol. I would always go first class on a glorious airline, so I would drink a lot. So when I first, because they had great wines and great liqueurs, when uh, and liqueurs and liqueurs, when I'd get to my hotel, I'd sleep for 15 hours and hydrate. But then the next day I would sit in the lobby for four hours, smiling at people until they smiled back. I would then ride the elevator for about two hours, standing at the door, facing in and smiling. And, and after people couldn't look down enough, they would look at me and smile. And then I would also get off on every floor and endeavor to talk and engage the staff, the housekeeper, the servers. And you could see when somebody smiled at you or even when they tried to engage you and acknowledge you, those people's body posture would change. They'd smile, their shoulders, they, they, it, it was visibly and and. Uh, it was perceptively impressive. And I believe every human being, they want to be acknowledged. They want to feel relevant. They want to be heard. They want to be, they want to be important is a relative term. They want to feel like they are uh, understood. Mm. Out of all the times you've done that all over the world, was there ever anything significant that you received back not long after? Uh, Which I know definitely wasn't your intention. I'm just curious. And it may not have been. I mean, I've gotten so much back, but but it's not, it's never my intent. And you know, I've gotten uh, invitations to join people at massive events or meetings that I never, because I would just engage them, you know, sitting somewhere. I've gotten to meet people's families. They take me to their home for dinner and I would go cause I thought it was a giggle. I've gotten, uh, uh, I've gotten all kinds of, of, uh, just these free meals, but it was never my intention. And probably more than that is I've gotten a sense of inner joy and fulfillment and satisfaction and uh, gratification that was exhilarating. In, it was intoxicating. Mm, that positive energy and just genuine curiosity about people in the world can lead to so much, not just for what it does for you, like helping people, but it does so much for, um, for other people as well. Um, there's a lot of people out there who they have a low self-esteem or they just adopted that and living that mediocrity mindset. Do you feel a big part of that is that they're not recognized externally by other people or they've attached their validation and self-worth to something externally? Or are there any other reasons you can think about as why you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, first of all, as we diluted, we think that our worth comes from the outside and it doesn't. I mean, it's great if you like my perspectives. It's great if your audience uh, appreciates it. Uh, it's, it's, it's fine, but whether they do or not, I have confidence that 
my beliefs for me are very, very righteous. They're very meaningful. I think we have to like ourselves. If we don't like ourselves, it's very hard to think anyone else can like us. Mm -hmm. And we have to like ourselves for the quality of human being we are, not for our stature, not for our body, not for, uh, you know, uh, our significance, but just we're a good human being. We, you know, we, we love, we, we, we laugh, we, we care, we empathize, we respect, we, uh, you know, we appreciate, we'd love to love the fact that we are a, uh, a meaningful human being. And the human condition is, it's a remarkable thing. I mean, there's no one out there. I mean, I'd, so I traveled so many places and I realized something profound, whether you go to China, whether you go to Japan, whether you go to, uh, Indonesia, whether you go to Vietnam, everyone's the same. Parents want better lives for their children. They want to work less. They want to have more happiness and joy. They don't want uh, their their families to have to suffer. And if you understand that every human being pretty much is the same, you know, you, you know, it, it's unfortunate that there's communist socialist there's political angst and 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 but deep down human beings are are fundamentally good people and they get awry because of you know this there's there's they get maligned in their values because they are deluded to think that what the world thinks of them is who they are and and when you try to live for others you'll never live for yourself Mm, what the world thinks of them is who they are. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, out of all the travel that you have done and different stages that you have had in your career, is there a particularly dark day that stands out you'd be open to sharing about? A dark day? Yeah. Sure. I can go with that. so many. I can tell share many of them because <laughs> it's just part of life. I got married the first time. I've been married three times. I'm not recommending it, but I have. <laughs> and uh, the good news is I have seven wonderful children. Most all are grown. But I got married the first time at age 18, and we eloped at the uh, at the uh, county courthouse. And on the way home, uh, which we didn't have an apartment, we were, we were forced to live with my parents. But on the way home, we were in the middle of a three-car uh, accident, and I got taken to my mother's with my then-wife in the cab of the wrecker of the tow truck. And we had this this undrivable car in the driveway. And we were only able to buy a car that wouldn't start when it rained. So my then wife had to get this car that you couldn't drive, but it, would, it was not legally drivable, but you could use it enough to push the other car down the street to start it. And I had to do that. Then I got my first good job and we saved to get our apartment. And the day we moved in, I was having to take three buses to go to work and I lost my job and I was too embarrassed. And so I didn't go home till the last bus. And that same week, I left our pathetic used car uh, open, and uh, someone stole the car seat, and I couldn't afford another one for two months. Uh, that was when I was young. I was in Dallas for a job that I thought was going to be my dream job, and it turned out I didn't perform due diligence. And I was selling things and putting all my expenses on my credit card and then getting reimbursed, but they went bankrupt when I had $10,000 worth of, of uh, charges, which back then was a lot. And then I was taking someone to lunch and in front of them, they cut my credit card out and I didn't have a penny to pay for it. That was very difficult. I, I, uh, when I first started making a lot of money, <coughs> pardon me, when I made a lot of money, I had one client only and they were paying me a lot, $200,000 on average a month. It was profit sharing. And this was in the seventies, a lot of money. And I, they were my only client, and I just bought with my then wife a, a, a new house, and we put every dime into fixing it. And the the business we were in, which was the commodities business, had a very bad setback, and they got in trouble. And in one day, I got a call that I was their biggest expense, and they cut me off, and I had no money at all, no other clients at all, spent everything. That was pretty pretty traumatic. I uh, 
I got more. I mean, I got plenty did, did more. Did that teach you about the importance of not putting all your eggs in a one basket? Yes, that's why I have many sources of income, many different <laughs> clients, many different, and that's why I always live below my means. Yeah. You came to my home. It's a beautiful home, but I could have afforded a house five times as nice when I bought it, and I realized there's always going to some, be someone that has a bigger house, but I had a lot of clients that would buy $20 million houses, and the first time they got in trouble, they lost everything. Mm. I never cared about that, uh, but I had fabulous setbacks. I mean, it's a funny, it's probably an oxymoron, a fabulous setback. But, <laughs> but it's a good attitude to failure. Yeah, yeah let's see. And hardship. Uh, well, it's very interesting. I went through a divorce I didn't expect to, and I was making tens of million dollars, and I ended up owing tens of million when I was out, and and um, I had an unexpected custody suit and uh right at the end i was so broke they took i had to sell my wife's mercedes to pay that month's legal fee and because i needed to pay another two hundred thousand and didn't have it i had to do somebody else's uh seminar and the only date they could do it conflicted with the do- court date when they uh when they uh adjudicated my you know my uh my uh, custody, custody and because okay. i didn't even look like i could go to the thing i didn't get custody of my or even uh even partial custody that was pretty painful i had a uh a business partner who i paid uh I, about 10 million dollars to to run my business and he ran it in the ga- in the ground and we we had to really regroup the whole thing after getting caught in an unexpected 25 million dollar uh uh, partnership dissolution litigation that I'd never planned for, and I lost all the money that I had then. You want me to go on? <laughs> What's so interesting about all of those things that you shared there is that just before that, you spoke about connecting to happiness and that the journey oh, yeah, I mean, joy is in the present. I think that's really profound. Well, life is about accepting that surprises, because somebody said something else to me. Uh, uh, they said, life isn't always fun. And life is not always fair, but it's always fascinating. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there? I mean, if you think about it, somebody also said you're either going to be a victor or a victim in life. And external, sort of what you said, but I'm not as 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 uh, articulate. The, the external factors aren't what are going to determine it. Mm. If you want to see who the cause of either of those outcomes will be, go in the mirror and point. Mm. That's who he or she is. Yeah, it's like that Stephen Covey quote from the start yeah. of the episode. And Stephen was a great friend and a mentor of mine, and his son is too, Stephen Mr., who's the who's the leading authority on on business trust building, which is quite a profound area to explore. Probably not appropriate for right now, but it's a really fascinating area. But yeah, I mean, I think you know, it, it, if if it, my mother used to say, "If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger." <laughs> but the truth is, I think experiences. I mean, somebody said to me, I'm sorry, I'm an ADD poster boy. Somebody <laughs> said once to me, how do you know when you are progressing? And I said, you're always progressing. You just may not recognize it. Every experience, if you learn what to do more of or less of, <laughs> you're progressing, aren't you? <laughs> what you do with it, you may not act on it, but you're progressing with every minute of every day, everything that happens. Every, every word you say, everything you, like when I have a conversation with anybody, an experience with any, like this, when I'm done and I'm by myself, I will spend 10 or 15 minutes reflecting on a number of things. What just happened? What did you say that I was really profoundly impacted by? How did you deliver in a way that I really found appealing that I might want to appropriate? What did I not like about you? What did I disagree with? What did I say that I really felt was very, very uh, impactful that I'm very happy I said? What did I say that I didn't like? What should I have said? What did I learn? How can I be better from all this integration? Most people, James, they go through life. If you ask somebody, what'd you do today? They can't really tell you. You said, How did, what was each segment of your day like? They don't know because it's just a big, hazy, phasy, amorphous, sort of it's just a it's just a opaque sort of a existence if you don't really live your life then you know 
what I mean, it's it's very interesting. I don't think most people really live. Mm, they just basically they're 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 voyeurs on the outer periphery. There's that you know that famous like the little boy with his little nose against the glass of the candy store. And if life is a candy store, most of us just have our little noses pressed against it when there's no one keeping us from walking in. Yeah. And they respond with something like busy when it's like, well, busy doing what? That's the real yeah. question. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've had people try to look at their, at their calendars for a, for a month and what they did. And it's fascinating uh, we have a very good friend. He's a prominent guy. His name is Perry Marshall. And he talks about four quadrants of a life. And he says, most people operate about three quarters of their time doing just wasteful things. You know, they're checking their emails, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're uh, prepping for doing nothing. And he said, very few people do what he calls Renaissance time, which is where you elevate yourself to this elevated and rarefied state where you're really, you're creative, you're, you're cleansing, you're regenerating, you're clarifying, you're invigorating, you're intoxicating, you're refueling your psyche. Mm. What was the tipping point for you to get so well known around the world? Was there a particular moment or action or decision mm -hmm. that you made? There was, there was. Uh, it was a, 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 it was an unintended, like you know the movie The Accidental Tourist. Mm. Well, it's a famous movie. <laughs> I'm the accidental. Uh, uh, marketing uh, expert. <laughs> so I always was active in helping companies grow their business. That's what I did in the beginning. And no one would have known me other than a couple of industries I was operating in in the background. But I went through a divorce and I had to stop doing it. And I decided I wanted to get back on the horse because when I did it, I was great. I was making tens of millions of dollars. And I'm talking about in the 70s and early 80s. When I started thinking, well, how did I do it? I had done it pretty intuitively. I had methodology, but it was automatic and it was, you know, it was conjured up here and I needed to figure out how to do it again because I lost the momentum. And I'd helped 40 or 50 uh, in newsletters. I'd helped Tony Robbins. I'd helped Success Magazine. I'd helped Entrepreneur Magazine. I'd helped all these influencers that back when they were really, they had followers and it was very, very tight bond and I'd made them hundreds of millions of dollars. And I asked if they would be willing to endorse a small little event that I was going to do that was going to be very audacious. And they all said yes, because they knew my, my ability to be rather remarkable and my intention to be the betterment of everybody. And I decided I was going to do a $15,000 event, which back then the average event was about a thousand dollars. And I was probably going to get 10 or 15 people, but it would force me to codify what had made me great so I could remember, so I could start doing it again. But they were willing to say really remarkable things about me, which were flattering. But instead of getting 10 people, we got 350 people the first time at $15,000. And I was shocked. <laughs> and I accidentally became a seminar giver. It was never my intent. And I started doing programs. And then as I did them, we started producing, ma I mean, I always had, like I did Entrepreneur Magazine and we grew it 900% in a year. I did ICA, we grew it 20,000% in 15 months. I did the investment firm, we grew it from 300,000 to 500 million in two years. So I had lots of, of profound, big success stories. But when I started doing the seminars, we got... We, we ended up, we got something like 100,000 success stories and we were able to really just tell the story. And I was that good at that time. Back then I had advantage over everybody because I understood things today that so much disseminated knowledge that that kind of advantage is a little bit less, uh, it's far more difficult to achieve. But I had such an advantage over everybody and I was so committed externally and I understood because I was always trying to understand the drivers of everything. So I understood it at such a seminal level that people had been benefited. I helped tons of people very honestly make tens of millions of dollars. So they were very willing to do what they'd never done, which is go way on the line is this guy is better than sliced bread. This guy made me all this money. This guy can help you do, 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 do. Trust me. And, and so as they were willing to say that, I just put it into uh, formats and 
my my reputation took off and because I was able to not just teach theoreticism, but I was able to help people see the implications, the applications, how to adapt and adopt it, uh, 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 basically correlate it to however they needed to apply it in their own business life. I just started getting testimonials after testimonial and it became really easy. The only reason that I stopped doing it is I guess got burnt out of being intellectual entertainment. I got very frustrated teaching people when most of them didn't do anything with it. And I liked working with private clients that did things. Mm. You've helped so many people all over the world. Who has helped you the most and what's the biggest lesson that you've got from it? Oh, Jesus. People ask me a variation of that and they think I'm avoiding it, but it's the opposite. So I've, had more mentors than you can imagine. I was mentored by the man I told you about. I was mentored by the founder of of Entrepreneur Magazine. I was mentored by the number one um, uh, direct response uh, copywriter in the world. I was mentored uh, by a man who is a a billionaire in the uh, mail order business. I was mentored by a billionaire uh, barter magnet. I mean, I've been very blessed because people have found me interesting enough that they would share. Uh, I've been mentored by uh, a famous private equity uh, firm executive. Uh, I have also, I've guided the 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 positioning for about 300 world-class experts. You talk about Tony Robbins and the Stephen Coveys, but I'd have every kind imaginable, and none of them came to me for help with their methodology. They came for help commanding the value their methodology should mean to somebody so people would be eager to avail themselves of it, to you know, to go to their seminar or to retain their, their advisory help. But I had to get a compression education first, so I got educated at 300 different, I mean, talk about sales. I mean, I helped, <laughs> as an example, the world's largest multivariable testing organization. And I looked at $2 billion worth of variations. People don't realize you do something one way, it produces X, you shift a little bit, it could be 10 X. I I worked with uh, the organization for the person who discovered process improvement, optimization, highest and best use theory. I worked with the world's largest strategic litigation consulting firm. They had 150 PhD sociologists and psychologists, and they would look at everything from uh, venue for litigation to jury selection to how to position the case. They had a graphics department, and it was very much like um, uh, a forensic account. And they would say, well, are we trying to depict pain and suffering or minimize it? And they could do that with graphic. And I did hundreds of experts, and I learned all these things, and sort of becomes a mishmash but I've been very blessed to be uh, to associate with a very, I think probably the biggest thing is I have either self-selected, been very fortunate or sought after people who had enormous integrity, an unimaginable moral compass, enormous, enormous ethos. And that's rubbed off on me. Mm. Is there an enduring lesson that you think about every day or something that you've incorporated into your life more than others? Yeah, but it's a little different because at my age, I wake up and the first lesson is thank you for waking up. (laughs) Because when you get older, you don't know if you will wake up. Mm. And so you- you, You're increasingly Yeah, As you get older, I mean, there is a, and I'm not going to be a member, I'm sorry, I I thought I'd be very lucid and maybe I'm not as lucid (laughs) as I'd like to be. But, you know, you realize as you get older, your wisdom level, I mean, your body may not be as good, but your wisdom. Your humanity, your humility, your compassion, your curiosity, your fascination with everything, you know, with life, with colors, with greenery, with flowers and birds and and little children and and uh, things that are a fascinating achievement, bridges that span an enormous amount, skyscrapers, uh, you know, uh, 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 pharmaceutical breakthroughs. I mean, you you become more, more f- just fascinated. And I think that curious little, you know, 
innocent childlike curiosity is very important. Mm -hmm. I think that humor is very important. You can't, you can't laugh and stay depressed. You can't laugh and stay negative. You can't. And I think that, that, uh, you always have to have, we, we used to talk about the three P's, purpose, passion, possibility, or maybe passion, purpose, and possibility. But if you don't have passion for something, someone, you can't have a meaningful purpose. If you have passion behind a purpose, then you have to be able to see the possibility and, and, and believe you can ma manifest it. There's a great quote, if you set your sights on the moon and the stars, one thing is, is certain. You won't end up with a handful of mud. You may not hit that, but you're not going to end up down there. And I've been, you know, I've been exposed to remarkable people, achievers, uh, humanitarians. One of my clients was the, the Ayurvedic physician to the Dalai Lama. So I've just had fascinating experiences on a worldwide basis. And it's made me not arrogant or egotistical or condescending or feel like I'm any better than anyone. I feel that I'm just an ordinary human being and everyone else has the same relative value, worth. It doesn't matter if they're the housekeeper or they're the the billionaire sky on, they all are just human beings. What about walking into those rooms? Did you ever feel like, hey, I'm a little bit nervous walking into a room with so many of these other people? Or did you feel like we're all... We're all equal. What was sort of your, your mindset and self-talk yeah. entering some of those environments? I mean, we're, we're talking about literally yeah, no, the, I understand. the most influential I, I, people in the, in the world. I've never been intimidated by anybody, but not because I felt I was any special. I felt I was irrelevant, but I don't mean that in terms of, of a denigrating self-esteem. I felt like I was more interested in them than I, I, I mean- I wasn't trying to impress them with me. I was just trying to learn about them. I just found everybody fascinating. And it did, but my uh, self-worth wasn't offended if somebody rejected me, although with all truth, very few people have because my intention is totally external. I think when you put your, your, your focus external, there's a great, there's a great uh, quote. It's the most selfish thing you can do is be selfless. And the reason that that is so is it gets so much more out of it. We are so limiting in the fulfillment we get when we're all consumed with ourselves, when it's not even important. I mean, whether you believe in karma or energy or any kind of a spiritual bet, there is a correlation between externally focused people and the richness they have in life and internally focused people and the sadness they have in life. Mm, mm. You are the personification of that. It's the Dale Carnegie quote where he talks about it's much better to be interested than interesting. I feel like you being able to carry that through the different stages of your career has enabled you to uh, absorb so much of the greatness from the other people that you have seen and connect with them. And I'm sure they've been able to, to teach you a lot of great things along the way as yeah. you've continued to level up in every way. Yeah. I mean, it's always been a natural um, facet of my being or my psyche, but I had an experience coincidentally in Sydney, Australia, 40 years ago that uh, really reinforced what you're sort of saying and I'll, I'll crystallize it and uh, maybe uh, contextualize it a little bit. So, when I started out, it was rather remarkable. I was earning at my seminars more money than most seminar givers were earning in a lifetime for one. We were so very significant. And I was traveling the world and selling out. Like when I'd go to Australia, we would do three seminars, three main ones, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, Queensland. And then we would; those were $5,000 in, um, in the 80s. And then we would do a $25,000 one at, uh, at uh, Sanctuary Cove out on surface at, at the Gold Coast. And we flew to Sydney one time and my family was tired and they went, I think we were in, it was, it, it was, I want to say the Sheraton, but I don't know what it was. It was one of the very top ones downtown and they went to bed and I couldn't sleep. And I went to the concierge uh, uh, floor, which was the top. And there was one man there and I was always curious. And he was the only one there. And I sat down and said, do you mind if I sit here? He goes, no. 
And I told him two things about myself, both of which were totally immaterial. I was from the United States and I was there on business. Only thing I told him. The rest of the hour and a half, uh, we were talking and I asked him questions. I found out he was from Germany. He traveled the world. He represented the largest pharmaceutical company. He called on third world health ministers. He sold population control systems. I was fascinated to what a population control system entailed. I asked him how he got a cold call with the third world health minister. I asked what they cost. I asked what the population thought about being controlled. I asked him uh, about uh, about the process. I asked him then about life in Germany. I wanted to know lifestyle, cost of living, education, where you went on holiday, you know, what the political system, the retirement system. Then I uh, asked him because he it found out he was there. It, I didn't pay attention, but there are all these security people. It was the, the, the location of the largest worldwide confab, uh, a convention or conference of world health ministers, not just third world, but everybody. And he was a key speaker, which fascinated me. And wow. and then I found out some other things about him. And all along, I was drinking cognacs and I was getting drunk. And I started feeling giddy and I stood up and uh, thanked him for the time and started walking away. And he stopped me and he said, I've got to tell you, you are one of the most interesting people I have ever met. Now, I told him two things, neither one of which had any material relevancy, nothing. I didn't say we're commanding more money per seminar than most people made in in a year or a lifetime. I didn't tell him that I was selling out. I didn't tell him I was renowned in my not niche in the entrepreneurial world. I just told him I was there on business. But I realized something. I When I got to the elevator, I remember leaning on the shaft, not on the shaft, but on the little frame and praying because I was pretty drunk by then that that when the door opened, there was an elevator, not a hole, because I would fall in. But I remember thinking it was it was life defining. It was perspective altering. It was really profoundly paradigm shifting. That what had just happened. I realized if you want to be interesting, all you have to do is be interested. If you want to be loved, you just have to love. If you want to be respected, you just have to respect. It's almost scarily just the polar opposite. And it was profound. And that shifted my life for the next 40 years. Mm, so true. The process of goal setting, is there something that you do personally in, in terms of goal setting? I'm not. I mean, I, the answer is intangibly and, and unstructured, yes. I have very vivid pictures in my mind of what I'm trying to accomplish. And it's a fait complete. It's already happened. And the people I'm going to accomplish don't know it. But I don't set written goals. I don't have a journal. I'm not saying that isn't wonderful. And I think this is so good because what I'm really getting at is how do you manifest things in your life? That's that's really what it is. Well, it's, it's, it's gotten easier and easier because, I mean, I created uh, 40 years ago a, a concept. It's called funnel vision versus tunnel vision. And the premise is that breakthrough thinking comes from outside your comfort zone and your reality. Most people live a life in in a um, in a band that's not their fault, but they pretty much their jobs are in the same field, their life is in the same field. But if you've been blessed like I have to travel literally and figuratively around not just the world geographically, but the world of businesses, it expands your perspective on what is possible. It's like the idea, if you live, we're here for everybody, I probably already know it, we're in Los Angeles. Almost everybody in Los Angeles has traveled outside of Los Angeles, certainly outside of California, probably outside of the United States, mm, probably half outside of North America, probably a goodly portion outside of this, you know, of this continent. So each time you travel a broader spectrum, you see other realities you hadn't contended with, geography, culture, uh, uh, religion, uh, uh, morality, uh, uh, topography, food, clothing, beliefs. And if you're open-minded, you take that all in and you expand it to what's called your worldview. Well, 
I have had so much expansion. I've been around the world figuratively probably 80 times. You know, I've been to Japan 20, 30 times, China 20, 30 times, Vietnam five or seven times, Singapore, Bali, London, Rome, uh, Switzerland, Amsterdam, Rotterdam. I hope you don't have to learn all the languages. <laughs> I, I get, unfortunately, I get translation. I've been to you know, said Vietnam, Thailand. I mean, so when you've done all that, your worldview is broadened beyond comprehension. And the fact, most people don't realize that if they would force themselves to travel outside their comfort zone, it would be enriching in ways they can't imagine. When we used to do our biggest seminars, I had a process that was laughably fun. When we had bookstores, which are very rare now, I would go to the bookstore, figurative, that's in my office, and we'd buy a thousand copies of either closeout books or magazines that were on nonfiction things, business, strategy, hobbies, uh, uh, skill sets. And we would... Uh, after the first couple of days of a seminar, we'd learn a little bit about each participant. All my staff would do it. And let's say that your hobby is, do you have a hobby? Yeah, I got plenty of hobbies. What is it? What's your biggest? Oh, it's hard with the two young kids right now. Once I go to the beach, it's one of my, one of my favorite things to do. Okay. Well, uh, if going or, to the beach or, is one of your favorite things. We might give you a book or a magazine about desert plants. If you like cooking, we might give you a book or a magazine on motorcycle repair. But whatever it was, it would be the total opposite that you absolutely in all of your life would never have even considered even reading, studying, thinking about. And we would send you away for two hours if you had a hotel or your room or in the lobby and read two chapters or two articles and come back to the group and present to them Two really amazing insights you had you never thought about that were actually fascinating and even some you could use in your life or business. And everybody did. And they were shocked. And I would make different people stand up so people saw all the vastness that different people got out of it. And it shifted people's recognition that there's all this discovery outside of their little insular world. Mm. Yeah, to have a breakthrough, you've got to get out of what you already know, get that outside perspective and information from parallel industries. I think it's so important, which is a good segue in terms of speaking a little bit, bit about business now. What do you feel are the biggest mistakes that small business owners are making today? <laughs> well- And is it uniquely different today or is it the same thing? As I it mean, it's probably, years? it's uniquely different in the marketing context because marketing is different as you know, most, a lot of it's digital. But the biggest mar mistakes are most people are not building a business, they're just promoters. I was I had a discussion this morning with a friend, and so I'll share you the essence. When I got started, I was known as a marketing wizard, and I was quite good at it, and I was way ahead of everybody else. And that's all I did was marketing and advertising. But as I got more and more into understanding the difference between a short-lived, uh, uh, I'll call it an enterprise, and an enduring, ever-growing business, I saw this big gap and i realized that marketing is a it's a driver of significant short term revenue it is that but it's an ever diminishing resource it, it it's like a gas in a tank but worse you have enormous number of external factors you can't control that could compromise your marketing one uh you could saturate your market two you could have competitors that are emulating you plagiarizing you or worse innovating you three you can have a new alternative to what your product service or category does come into the market three you can saturate as i said that saturate the media four you can have x or five six seven whatever it is external factors you can't control a covid so now you can't go to the conventions and the conferences where you exhibited you can't do the dinner meetings you can't keep your retail open. You can't get in the car and go call on a business. So I realized that the real denominators of constantly improving, compounding, sustainable, enduring success are having a killer strategy that out, out, uh, uh, it's far more strategic than anyone else. Having a really superior business model, having 
uh, a value proposition that is irresistible. Having a uh, distribution channel uh, or many ones that are so broad and enduring, having strategic alliances, partnerships, endorsement relationships, being the recommended provider, having a referral network, also having a not just a competitive advantage, but a preemptive one that is so powerful, no one can even come close. And finally, knowing how to reclaim sunk costs, leads that don't buy, inactive buyers that stop buying, buyers that are buying but could buy a lot more things, sales channels you could do a lot more with, put other products through, a brand you're only using for one thing, uh, salespeople where there's a lot of variation, one does very well, one doesn't, and you don't really try to improve them. And if you do all those things, then having great marketing is the cherry on the icing on the cake. And when most people talk about competition, they're not really thinking with with uh, a nuclear vision for this. They're thinking in terms of the marketing. They're saying, I want to be compete, but they're looking at your external superficial veneer part of the business. Uh, also, I created years ago, not 40 years ago, but years ago, something called relate, or excuse me, revenue system optimization. Everybody has a revenue system. They don't always know what it is. And they literally don't even understand all the interconnected levers that drive it. If you think about our personal life, James, it has been enhanced and elevated over the, over the years or the centuries by levers, screwdrivers, wheelbarrows, light switches, brooms, push buttons that open your car door, cranks that open a window, pop top cans. Those are all levers. But in business, there's enormous. I've got 97 categories of levers that I've identified that give you the same kind of, of, of really almost exponential propellant in your performance. And most people don't do that. Another thing is almost every small, medium business is tactical. They don't have a great operating strategy. It would take me a long time to give you examples of this. And they don't really try to optimize. I learned that you can change a headline or the equivalent. The equivalent is what you say the first time you interact with somebody. It's the subject line. It's the headline in your landing page. It's the first paragraph of a sales letter. And you can get 50%, 500%, as much as 2,100% difference. You can change the positioning and get a 50 to 100% difference. You can add or enhance a risk reversal and get another 50 or 100. You could add certain credibility and proof, testimonials, endorsements, uh, measurable comparability that shows your superiorities. All these are separate and get 50 to 100%. You can add a bonus and get... And most people don't even do any of that. We tested one time for a very large furniture store, 33 different ways of greeting people at the front door. And one of them tripled conversion. No more paid, same amount of money spent to bring the leads in. No more time, just three times more revenue. And there's, I, I learned all those things and most people don't learn that. And one, one more thing, which is really tragic. When we had bookstores, real interesting um insight you'd walk in a bookstore and there would be uh, we're in a we're in a room that's more squared but if it was vertical you'd be you'd see these these vertical walls being lined with books in a category uh psychology relationship parenting sexuality uh uh self you know self-worth over here it might be skills and then you walk and there's this teeny tiny end part that had business books strategy, marketing, advertising, selling, things like that. Because most entrepreneurs didn't get into business to really to really build something epic. They didn't get into business to be preeminent. They didn't get into business to really maximize and optimize everything they did. They got it to escape either working for somebody or as a reactive result to a life trauma. They got fired, they got divorced, they were an alcoholic, a druggie, whatever. So they don't seem to see the correlation between superior expertise and higher performance. But I've helped so many experts that I'm obsessed with that. For example, there is one woman uh, who is the expert in in how you are seen. She can show you that by being seen more 
more fascinating, you can triple the impact you have as a salesperson, as a leader. Stephen M. R. Covey has shown that if you can master the 13 characteristics of ultimate trust building, it will triple your your sales. It'll shorten your sales cycle. It'll increase your impact as a leader. A man named Roger Love has proven that you can quadruple your impact by what he calls strategic communication, tonality, uh, inflection, pausing. I'm doing it right now. I mean, there's hundreds of these. And these sad, and they're not really an entrepreneur. A true entrepreneur is a man or woman who's created a business that's adding supreme value experientially in the market. Most small, medium businesses are proprietors. They're just one of then their commodities or their or their um, marginalized, and they're just taking they're just taking economic oxygen out of the the the, the world. But they're not adding a supreme value. And I'm just giving you. You asked me yeah, yeah. what are some of the mistakes. Those are a couple. I think people can rewind. They'll get a massive amount of value out of that. And I should say that Jay has a huge amount of free resources available on his website Abraham.com as well. So many things out there. So there's one of the things that he mentioned before a few minutes ago. You can rewind and go listen to that, and then you can go and look it up on Google or on his website, and you'll get access to those free resources he has available. With so many things that you mentioned there. When you go into a business, what is the first thing or what are the first things that you're looking for in terms of being able to diagnose the problem or give them the, the one or two things they need to focus on? If, I was, if you were going to be a client of mine, the first thing I would do is give you a 200-question assessment that you probably couldn't answer. But ask questions you should be asking yourself constantly about correlations, about implications, about quantifying performance, what's a lead cost you? How many does it take to convert? How many buyers buy the first time? How many buy this? What's the performance of this? And then it shifts and asks questions that almost nobody can answer that it's small. Tell me everything you know about all your direct and indirect competition. So I try to see where you are. What's your what's driving you? What's your strategy? Can you even tell me? How are you executing? What are, how are your different sources? What are they sources? Do you have how many products? What do you do when somebody doesn't buy? What do you do when they stop buying? What do you do while they're buying? I guess I have kinds of questions. How many distribution channels? Things like that. Then what we do is we divide and conquer. I usually divide a, a an advisory relationship into two parts. The first is called maximizing. The second is called multiplying. Maximizing says that you are doing activities right now to generate revenue. They may be dumb activities relative to not, you're not dumb. They're just not, they're very suboptimal. Let me put it that way. Let me amend that suboptimal, but they're driving the business. So rather than taking it away and having the business stop, we try to make them much more profitable. Even if I would ultimately replace them with far more sophisticated or higher yielding or lower risk or faster producing alternatives. But then after we've gone through all of that, we then use the additional cash flow it normally produces to start doing what we call the additive stuff, the replacement stuff, the stuff that you have to experiment with and you need to play around with some uh, some expenses. So we do those two things right away, and then I get more sophisticated. After I've gone through that cycle, we may recycle because you'll be in a different place, and then we start being very sophisticated. I start with the three ways to grow a business. We increase your your sources of getting buyers. We increase the revenue size you do every time you do a transaction ethically, so you get a lot more profit per transaction. We figure out how to extend the 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 uh, frequency and the lifetime value of a buyer or find more utility ways to utilize and monetize ethically that buyer. Then when we've done all of that, we then go to the advanced three ways. We help you penetrate a new market every year. We help you introduce, acquire, or create a new product or service every year. Then we start looking at what businesses, products, services, or intangible things we can buy. It might be a whole company that's competitive that you bring together. It might be a product or service people buy before, during, after. It might be competing with yourself, buying what they would buy if they don't buy yours. Then when we've done that, we start working on your strategy first, your business model second, your uh, your marketing third, your uh, process system procedure. I got about nine things and we just keep doing things like that. <laughs> 
Is there a certain client that you have had uh, that's a transformation that just is memorable for you and just stands above so many of the others? Well, there's so many. We had the number, we had, it was the number nine candy company in China that became the number one and sold uh, whatever legally you can, 49% to Hershey's. We had a little cosmetic surgery group in Japan that ended up having 87 offices using a strategy of mine. We have a company that was a small player in the uh, timeshare uh, cancellation market, and they became they became the number one, and they grew many times over. We had the number one company in the gold uh, brokerage firm. We had a co-founder of Federal Express that used a, a concept of ours. I had uh, the co-founder of are the co-CEO of Keller Williams Real Estate. We had the guy who started Planet Fitness. I mean, Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> Bulletproof Coffee. I can't give I mean, you yeah, Damon John, all kinds of people. Yeah. A lot of these situations you've been involved in, you need to get a yes. You need to get a yes for someone to work with you. You need to get a yes at all these different stages. What are you focused on to get a yes in the most important conversations of your life? Yeah, I think the most important way to do it is not to try to force anything. It's to try to get that person to come to the decision themselves because they, they, you help them understand what's really what their alternatives are or what they. I mean, Tony Robbins calls it a Dickens pattern. What's going on yesterday? What's going to? What's happening now? And what'll be happening tomorrow if nothing changes? Versus if you change. And rearticulating it, uh, for example, I have a client that is trying to buy uh, a business from from someone, and uh, the person that has the business, it's a, I'll tell you the story. I have a client that has a very large medical products business in a country that is a uh, Caribbean country. They're very successful, but they have a very high part of most of the products, but they don't have a certain number of product line. They wanted to buy somebody's business that has a product line they wanted. The, there are two owners. One is retired and the other one is younger and running. The younger one is the managing director and he summarily rejected the overture. He wouldn't even talk about it. And the, the retired one is about my age and I'm over 70. So, uh, I, we looked at the numbers and we realized that the most each was making, because it's a very small niche, is about $150,000 a year. The business could have, we would have paid a couple million dollars. Divide that in half, that would have been six or seven years worth of income to both of the partners. And we could have had one of the partners, the managing work for us. But I had them go back and remind the partner that was running it, what he was really saying. He was saying that for the probable life expectancy that the retired one, who's my age, maybe has five or seven years left to live on average. So what the managing partner was saying is he denied that person twice the quality of life, which he would have made because we would have given him enough that he had two times what his lifestyle was being now. So instead of 150, he would have had 300,000 a year for the next five or seven years and making sure he understood what he was really saying when he said no. So when I work or try to work or try to get a yes for anything, buy-in, doing something, I don't try to tell them what to do. I give them historic examples, case studies, and then I tell them what their current attitude is telling me they're really saying to themselves they've never heard. And see, not my life. I'm not the one who has dedicated my entire life, my hopes, my dream, my capital, my my economic uh, fulfillment, my financial fulfillment, my my retirement expectations, my lifestyle, my kids' education to this business. You are. I'm just the one trying to help you. If you don't want to do it that way, it's it, you're the one. I, I don't need this. And I have one more advantage, very frankly, and it's not, not theater. My life is like a um, bus stop. I have more opportunities, deals that come to me in a day than most people would see frankly, in a lifetime. And if I don't, I can go to anybody and I have a track record. So I'm not, I don't need anything, if that makes sense. When you don't need anything, but instead you want something for the opportunity to contribute, your posture is very different. Yeah, People are used to people that are going to sell them. 
You're in a much better negotiating position. You're not yeah, in the convincing you don't care. game as well. Pardon? You're not in the convincing game. I don't well. care. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. You know, it's okay. I said, don't do it. I don't care. I, I just pray. The, the, the concept is pray I don't go to work for your competitor. I love that. And, and I would say that, but not in a threat, but just from the heart. Yeah. It, 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 that if the reality I, is they're going to be disrupted by someone if they don't have the attitude and yeah, be willing and, to invest and, and grow. And most of them need dramatically to extricate, extricate themselves from a commodity type existence. But yeah, but yeah, I, it's not a problem for me, but, but I have probably <laughs> evolved to a point, just not evolved because I'm so bright. It's just, I have a, a, the, the power force behind my posture is a little bit different than most people's, I think. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, last question before the rocket round on your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flash card that you could show yourself on your worst day? <laughs> I don't know that I would even have that answer. I mean, I believe that uh, that we make our reality. I believe that you can change. Tony Robbins probably said it better. You can change your reality in a heartbeat. I believe that uh, there are solutions. The only thing we can't solve is being dead. You know, but most business reversals, most economic reversals, most relationship reversals can be solved. I always said this, when you meet people that don't like their job, don't like their lot in life, don't like their marriage, don't like their body, with exceptions of acts of God or, or birth defects or mental infirmary or, uh, or uh, hormonal problems that can't be uh, uh, medically adjusted, if you don't like something, guess what? You can change it if you're willing to pay the price. I mean, I'll tell you really something that fascinates. It doesn't anymore uh, upset me, but we have for years done massively informative educational webinars. And we do it because most people can't possibly afford my fees, but I can afford to freely share because I think that if you're going to be in business, you might as well get and give the most out of it. And people will sign up. And then you probably know this, this historic show up rates about 20%. Mm. So 80% of the people who purportedly are lamenting constantly, they wish their business was more successful. They wish their, their profits were bigger. They wished it was easier. They wished it was more satisfying. They wish they weren't stressed. They wish they could have the things they want. It's all they, they, they. It's not, they, I wish I could contribute more. They can't even find two hours to commit, but they'll continue doing that. So the point is, you don't like anything, you can fix it. I mean, the only thing you can't fix is death. Now, there are physical ailments. As we get older, unfortunately, things go wrong in our body. But the majority, not all, can be managed if we were, are willing to, you know, to take the precautions, if you're willing to do the physicals, take the test, alter your 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 nutrition i mean but how badly do you want it i mean i think that and, and this is going to sound a little bit not calloused and not uh brutal but i don't have as much compassion for people who spend more time lamenting than progressing and, and i'm saying it as somebody who's had more setbacks i mean i gave you this much <laughs> doesn't really matter but you know, I have here, I almost lost my leg. I had a, a, a medical injury and I had to get emergency operations. It's, you know, it's shit happens. I mean, without shit happening, life wouldn't be real. But what, how you proactively deal with it. And in my opinion, most people, they, 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 they embrace realizations more as intellectual entertainment. They go, yeah, that's so cool. I, that makes total sense. I mean, when we do events, I don't even use the testimonials you get at the end of an event because that's affirmational. It's like what I'm going to do. I only want to use the ones when people did something mm -hmm. because there's a big disconnect between knowing and doing. Absolutely. And I just think most people 
you know, it, it, all the, all, if you think about security, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very, very, uh, misunderstood construct. All security in life is, is the faith, the confidence, the trust you have in yourself and your ability to perform, your ability to extricate, your ability to circumnavigate, your ability to bounce back, your ability to rebound, your ability to be resilient, your ability to be a victor instead of a victim. And that's a private discussion you have to have with yourself. Yeah, people think they need to manufacture extra time to make these good circumstances. The exact same amount of energy that you're using to complain about what you don't have can actually be transmuted to create the circumstances that you want. The, Stop bitching about it. Start doing it. Yeah, there's research that I saw. There's that. There's something like three times the energy is expended procrastinating, equivocating, contemplating, uh, than doing, and and uh, something like an even greater. Uh, uh, correlation, negative correlation of, of, uh, of, uh, of negative, of negative, uh, energy. I mean, you have to realize progress is the most exhilarating thing. You can even little progress. Mm -hmm. Cause when you look back, you know, there's that edge, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a step, mm -hmm. but most people don't have the wherewithal. There's one more thing, which is an actual, it's a little bit, uh, sad, but maybe I can give some, some uh, solace to this and a, and a reframe. So the people that decide to do things, the majority of them have never done anything like that in their life. And what happens is the first time they try, they do not get a great outcome. Now you have two little children. I have seven. They're now adults. Anybody watching, listening, if they think about when they had little children at the age of about one and they were learning to eat, sleep, uh, uh, poop, uh, speak, eat, sleep, speak, poop, not sleep, eat, eat, poop, walk, uh, or speak, they were terrible at the beginning. You know, they would fall over, they would, they would miss the toilet, they would put the spoon in their eye, and only because... Somebody who cared deeply, a champion, a fan, a parent, would keep helping him progress a little more. Most people, when they endeavor, when they break through the morass and they extricate themselves from the mental miasma of constraint to say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. James and Jay said, finally, I'm not just going to think about it and, and intellectualize it. I'm going to transactionalize it. The first time they try, they do shitty terrible and then they retreat right back to status quo see i can't do it and they think of they should be world class uh gold medal uh pole vaulters the first time they ever pick up a pole when they've never worked out they have weak shoulder muscles <laughs> i mean it's dumb isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> Well, let's turn over to the Win the Day Rock around 10 questions for some quick answers. You up for this one, Jay? Go ahead. Cool. Uh, number one, what quote inspires you the most? Um, there's a quote that I used to use all the time to conclude my seminars, and I think it was actually by a man who died. His name is Bob Proctor, but the quote was pretty cool, and I may be just paraphrasing, but it, it's that, let me see if I can articulate it right. Um, hold on, because I haven't said it for a long time, but it's it, it was very profound to me when I first heard it. It's that um, most people struggle in their life with the nonverbal um, torment of the following question. Am I really worthy of this goal? Can I really change my life? Can I really have a happier marriage? Can I really get my body? Can I really become financially successful if I have a business? Can I really make this business significant? He said, when you realize how much more is possible from time, opportunity, effort, resources, emotion, commitment, dedication, the right question to ask is not, is, is, is the goal worthy of me? It's the opposite. Excuse me, is, am I worthy of the goal? It's the opposite. Is the goal worthy of me? Because you can do so much more. I don't think people realize that they're their own, they're their own constraint. Anything you want to learn, you can learn. I mean, now 
You go, well, I wish I'd gone to college and learned that. I mean, Jesus, you can get a whole education online probably for little or nothing. You I get mean, GPT to write a book for you for free on that yeah, subject. Yeah. You don't even need to learn. For, yeah. 20, for, for free or for $20. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can, I mean, what is it that, what is it you don't have that you want? I mean, anything within reason. And people will go, well, I wish I had gone to law school. And, he's, and the ad is just, well, how old are you? 40. Well, okay, do you really want to be an attorney? Sure. How long is it going to take? 10 years in high school. Okay, what are you going to be doing in 10 years? If you're alive, you're going to be 50. So what? How badly do you want anything? And what price? And it's not a price in terms of pay. It's what investment. If you think about all of life, you're investing. And you're investing, whether you do nothing, that's a negative investment. Or if you just go through the motion, it's a neutral investment. Mm. What what compound return, what yield do you want on the investment you're making in your life? Mm. And if you don't know, it's probably very little, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. If you had, one second, if you had yeah. all your investments in the hands of a portfolio manager and they produce suboptimal, below market yield, would you keep your money there? Mm-mm. Your dad's in that field. Mm, you'd get you'd it take out it out right away. But your <laughs> investment portfolio called your life and all the different things you're investing in, I can promise the vast majority are getting a, they're getting a below market yield. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an eroding yield. And if your portfolio is eroding, would you keep it one minute with anybody? Time to make some changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Yes. <laughs> I do both. I have a, a pot of coffee for of ADD and... Caffeine tends to uh, to bring you to stability. I have almost a pot in the morning and stop, and I have a couple of glasses of wine. Sometimes I'll have a uh, a bourbon uh, at night. I, do, I used to like uh, alcohol too much; it didn't like me. Now I just do it. I would call it moderation. But when I go uh, when I go home, I'll probably have a, a bourbon or two. Mm. I heard a great quote the other day, everything in moderation, even moderation. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Uh, I wish that my parents had taught me, uh, and it doesn't mean you can't learn, but I wish they taught me to have a love for the arts and culture. I wish they would taught me financial literacy I wish that I had compound invested starting at a young age. I wish I had put more of my resources in passive investments that would appreciate and work harder for me. I wish I had had more balance. I was a workaholic most of my life. And I wish I'd spent more quality time with my family. So lots of things. Mm. Number four, what book do you gift the most apart from your own? Uh the book that I used to gift, I bought a thousand copies and gave them all away, was a book on um, on marketing called, it was a double book. It was called Scientific Advertising and My Life in Advertising. It was written by the man who figured out um, uh, measurable marketing and allowable acquisition costs and risk reversal named Claude Hopkins. And I read that book 50 times and it altered the rest of my life. So it was a very profound book. Uh, I've only read usually uh, uh, business type books. I don't read as many biographies. and But yeah, that book still I give to people when I uh, can. As far as, you know, as, as uh, uh, personal achievement, I like Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. I thought that was a really good book. Yeah. A really good book. And also that Stephen's son, his book, The Speed of Trust, explores the the uh, the perception we have that we are totally trusted by people when, in fact, we aren't. Mm. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yep, yeah, uh, probably, but not very often because I was just, I was like childlike in my innocence. I think people mistake vulnerability for a weakness and it's probably the ultimate strength. I don't think there's anything wrong with being vulnerable. I think it's to think that you're omnipotent. I mean, I laugh when I see these these young uh, info marketers who uh, would have you feel like they're they have the whole world by the hand. Everything is right. They got the girls. They got the cars. They got the they got the house. They got everything. 
And, and, you know, we don't, nobody's got everything. And even if you have everything, it can, it's dynamic. It changes, but a vulnerability is being able to laugh at yourself, to know that we're an imperfect person and we're always, or we should always be wanting to improve mm. and learn. Well said. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Uh, a, a great book that uh, somebody who was an influence on me wrote, he was a three-time Super Bowl quarterback and all three times they lost and they lost in front of a total of about 300 million people. And he had a business reversal that was horrific and and it was it was uh, uh, spread all over all the business newspapers. And he wrote a book that said, failure is not permanent. And failure is not permanent. It's just a temporary, I mean, unless you decide. If you're down for the count, you're down for the count. If you want to dust yourself off and jump back in the ring and come back with a vengeance, it's, I mean, it, you have total control. Again, with very, there's, there are acts of God you can't control and a few anomalies, but most everything in your life you have control over. Mm. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Um, I would enjoy probably Einstein, but not for the reason you think. Not for his intellect, although that would be interesting, but I'm not that scientifically ex a, a, astute. If you study Einstein, which I did for quite a while, he had a fabulous sense of humor. He had a childlike curiosity. He had a tenacity when he was trying to solve something that was unimaginable. He had a, a, an appreciation for humanity that was unheard of. He loved everybody irrespective of their stature. And he didn't take himself too seriously, and he took naps every day. <laughs> Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? My assistant. Mm. I can't. I'm a mad scientist. I lose track of everything. <laughs> Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. I have, and I'm very close to it. I've worked with companies all over the world, but I've never really had the chance to do a lot with private equity. And I have recently had a serious negotiation with the top performing private equity firm in the United States, and it's a very significant, many, many, many billions of dollars because it has a huge portfolio of different businesses that stimulate me, and the owner of it has been moved by my work, and that interests me, but that's in business. I mean, in in my personal life, probably to, uh, you know, to have uh, a number of more years of being able to, you know, contribute to, you know, my family and humanity and and to gain i mean i i think we don't let we the idea of joy happiness fun there's there's two gradients there's superficial tentative very short lived and then there's more permanency and i think if we can move from that you know we're going to go out and party and get drunk or we're going to go i mean and then we're going to go back to our life of quiet desperation that's not, I mean, that's a, a short term panaceas, they diminish. I think it's figuring out how to have your life be joyous all the time, including during reversals, including during ad, adversity, including when everything doesn't work exactly. Because it is, life is joyous if you want it to be. Yeah, that's the real goal. Uh, and final question number 10 what's one thing you do to win the day? Uh, I make sure that every day I connect with somebody and make them know that they are relevant, but not by saying you're relevant, by you know being interested, by contributing, by adding uh, perspective, by listening. Most people don't know how to listen. I love it. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Jay, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Real Jay Abraham, grab a copy of his books on Amazon, and check out the hundreds of free resources he has available on his website, abraham.com. Again, all that and more will be linked in the show notes. Jay, what a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win The Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. 
And if you found value in the Win the Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win the Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.